Thank you all for coming out on Columbus Day. I guess it's Indigenous Peoples Day here in California, so it's a holiday, and thank you. Uh, it's my second talk here this year, so I'm, I'm glad to see some, so many of you come for a return engagement. Uh, this is the first time I've uh, ever talked about a, a work in progress, and uh, it's kind of exciting. It's a work that I dare say has really captivated me for a number of years. And as you can see, I'm uh, doing something that is something of a, uh, somewhat of a departure for me, whereas most of my other work is about books and book culture. This is uh, my first true uh, biography. But there is uh, a resonance from all the earlier work to this one because I am de dealing with materiality as I have with, with all of my, uh, my earlier books. Needless to say, the dual biography, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, we all know him as the great fireside poet, the 19th century poet who was the most popular poet of his day, perhaps the most popular po uh, person in the United States, even more popular than the president of the United States. Some have called him our first rock star, which I think is true, but I think it went well beyond that because he was beloved by presidents, by, the, by royalty. Uh, the Queen Victoria invited him to visit her in England. Dom uh, Pedro, the king of Braz Brazil, visited him at his home in Cambridge. He was just an enormously influential person and one of our first great canonical writers. Uh, we all probably know also that in the years of the 20th century, he was cast out of the canon, which is, I dare say is unique that we would have a canonical writer who for some reason fell afoul of the modernist critics. All of a sudden a poet who could be understood and who wrote in rhyming verses, I guess was deemed uh, perhaps not up to snuff. But anyway, he's a vastly interesting person. This is by no means the first biography to be written of Longfellow, but it is the first major one in 50 years. And the first, I do believe, that will give his wife, uh, Frances Appleton Longfellow, the great love of his life, her fair due and a major biographical work. Up until now, she has been really um, uh, a, a, a marginal figure. We, we see her on the margins and she disappears after uh, her horrific death after 18 years of marriage. So the title of the book is Cross of Snow, The Love Story and Lasting Legacy of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Let me just, let me ask, uh, how many of you are familiar with the sonnet, Cross of Snow? Wonderful, great, nobody. <laughs> Uh, it was a poem written uh, on July the 9th, uh, 1878, 18 years to the day of the death of his wife, Fanny, and they had been married 18 years, and he never got over it, and the poem, Cross of Snow, has provided for me, it's a sonnet, I believe that you'll, uh, you, uh, people will, will uh, argue that uh, Longfellow's sonnets really stand right up there with those of Shakespeare and Keats, and I, might, I hope there are no smirks, he's a wonderful uh, sonneteer. Uh, many of his other poems are somewhat dated, but his sonnets are magnificent. This one, which was uh, written in 1878, uh, he never published during his lifetime. It was found among his papers. His brother Samuel, who wrote the first biography of him, published it as an appendix in the first biography shortly after his death. So I, this is the only poem that we will do tonight, but, but it's 14 lines, and it really has provided for me the arc of the narrative of my book. And so here we go. And I'll even read it aloud, if I may. In the long, sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall where round its head the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. So this is on the second floor room of their home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's the portrait he's talking about. That's the bed he's sleeping in. Here in this room she died, and soul more white never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose. Nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite. Now, a lot of people might say, oh, there's Henry Longfellow again, finding this obscure word, archaic word, benedite, just so he can rhyme it with white. You know, it's like, listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere, and that's why Paul Revere, not Prescott or Dawes, uh, became the famous writer. No, well, actually, I did a Google search, wonderful Google, of all of the literature, right, all, all of the books that are online, looking for the who else has used the word benedite. Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Longfellow on three earlier occasions, and he used it in his translation of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Longfellow, in the aftermath of his wife's horrific death, was the first American to translate uh, Dante into English, and that's what he turned to. And uh, when we talk about the lasting legacy, you will find in my book, and also I believe in the story of his life, and even in the framework of this sonnet, 
that this really became his true great accomplishment. As he said once, when I, in times of stress, when I can't think of anything original, I return to Dante and I return to the translation. So there we have Benedite. Benedite, by the way, was a word derived from Benedict, St. Benedict. It's a blessing. It means blessing. And he used it three times in Purgatorio. He used it twice in Purgatorio, and he used it in Paradiso. And it's where he sees Beatrice. And you can say there is definitely a, a comparison here between Beatrice and his wife, Fanny. And we talk about martyrdom of fire. Well, of course, how many of you are familiar with the means of the circumstances of Fanny Longfellow's death? Well, my friends don't count. But, uh, well, we'll get to it in a bit. I promise we'll get to it. So here's the Western connection, by the way. Jennifer said, Lit Quake and Book Club of California, we're dealing with, we're dealing with the West. Well, here's the Western connection. This is a mountain in Colorado. There is a mountain in the distant West that sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. There had been talk, it's 1874, about this mountain in Colorado, out in the Rockies. It had a cross of snow upon its side. And this photographer, William Henry Jackson, went out with a group from the Geological Survey. They located it. He photographed it. We believe Longfellow saw this particular photograph. William Jennings Bryan did a book. We know it's in there. That book, unfortunately, is not in the Longfellow house but it's in the Harvard Library and it's the Boston Athenaeum where he read. But we do know that he saw this painting, uh, Thomas Moran's Oil on Canvas, 1875. That's a, a watercolor that was preparatory for it. Uh, this painting now hangs in the Gene Autry Museum, by the way, in Los Angeles, another California connection. Uh, and it was this spectacular painting. It was at the Centennial Ex Ex uh, Exposition in Philadelphia. Longfellow went there and it also toured Boston. And Longfellow is this great poet of place. He's, he is determined to be writing about the American character or the American experience. All of his epic poems, Hiawatha, Evangeline, The Courtship of Miles Standish, are basically using European structures but telling American stories. The love story, by the way, is not only between Longfellow and his wife, but between Longfellow and America and America with him. Uh, he saw this, he was moved by this mountain. This is the cross he wears upon his chest. And who is he talking about? He's talking about this wonderful woman who you see here. And this is uh, how Fanny Appleton Longfellow appeared when he met her. Uh, this is part of the narrative, by the way, the story. It's a seven year courtship. She spurned him for six years. He had been reeling from the death of his first wife. I'll get to that presently. He had been wandering. He had been in Europe learning languages. He could speak 12 languages fluently. He was the first professor of modern languages at Harvard University and at Bowdoin College in Maine. Part of the deal of accepting the, the new position at Harvard was to go to Europe and learn new languages. He went there with his wife, Mary. She died, the first wife, Mary, who you'll see in the next slide, uh, after a miscarriage. And he was wandering, he was grieving, he was headed for Italy, and he couldn't, his visa wouldn't let him into Italy. He went into Switzerland and he ran across this Boston Brahmin family, the Appletons. <clears throat> they befriended him and for a fortnight he traveled with them and he just fell ho hopelessly in love with Fanny. Fanny is the woman on the right and uh, that is a portrait that was painted of her during the grand tour of Europe that she and her family, the Appletons, were making. It was in France in 1836, the same year that a uh, young woman with the ringlets. My wife tells me these are ringlets. I thought they were pigtails. But uh, <laughs> both of these objects, by the way, are in the Longfellow house. And we will be talking really s much of this particular talk and the presentation is about material culture. What I believe I'm bringing to this biography, there have been many biographies. Again, the first, this is the first in 50 years, but the first to really use materiality the resources of this remarkable house in Cambridge, Massachusetts that is now the property under the custodianship of the National Park Service. For me, it's like a little Herculaneum. It's filled with 800,000, that is not an, an exaggerated figure, 800,000 artifacts and documents, all relating from the, Long, from the Longfellows and its prior occupants. We'll get to that presently. So this is Mary, the first wife. We can't forget her. Uh, if we think that Fanny is a is a, a figure on the margins. Poor Mary was the, real, the first love of his life. And prior to a, a few months ago, really, the only uh, 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 representation of her was the painting on the right. She was from Maine. He was from Maine. 
Uh, that painting is in the Maine Historical Society. This picture on the left is in the Longfellow House. It's not on the walls, it's in storage. And uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Dana, the great grandson of Henry uh, Wadsworth Longfellow and curator of the house for many, many years, attributed this, believed this to be a portrait of Mary, but it's been in uh, storage for years. And I think, I don't know if you can see much of a resemblance, but I'm, I'm inclined to say it is. We know every other woman in the house who's had anything to do with the Longfellows, uh, their identities, why is this portrait there? We believe it to be Mary. In any case, I'm giving her a chapter in the book. She deserves a chapter, and there's enough information to talk about it. But really, this is the locus. This is the Longfellow House, 105 Brattle Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts. I live 40 miles from here. Uh, I am able uh, to, uh, I've, been, I've been given uh, full use and full run, obviously, with, with uh, people by my side. But to go through the artifacts and to learn this house, this house is not only a witness to everything, just about everything that goes on in this story, but it is a laboratory for me. It is filled with these material objects that I, I believe will help me give life and put flesh on, on the bodies of these characters. Uh, it's a beautiful Georgian house. It was built in 1759 by Major John Vassal. He was a Tory. As the, as the American Revolution drew near, he fled uh, He fled the house. And when George Washington came in to, t uh, to take command of the Continental Troops, this was, the, this was his command headquarters. Washington lived in this house for nine months. I'm spending two to three days a week. I've been doing, going there for about a year. It's 40 miles away. They even let me park there. Isn't that wonderful? In Harvard Square. Any of you know Harvard Square? That's a pretty good deal. Here it is in summer. Here it is in winter. We had a pretty tough winter. Here it is in fall. I'm, we're going back tomorrow, and I understand uh, we're at full peak, so I'm going there by the end of the week to get some beautiful autumnal pictures, but there's a wonderful garden out back. Gives you a sense of the autumnal look. And here it is in spring. I took these lilacs just a few weeks ago. I have Henry's journal. It's never been published, but it's, uh, it's uh, fully searchable. I have the entire journal. And I was just searching when spring came along for lilacs, and I just found this. The purple buds of the lilacs tip the hedges and the flowery tide of spring sweeps on. It really bugs me. People say that Longfellow's journal is not very revealing. I think they're looking for uh, insights into his creative process. But he does give you the affairs of the day. And he has some wonderful lines like this. And what is really significant about this particular entry, it's May 20th, 1861. It's just two months before the horrible, horrific death of his wife, Fanny, in an accident that I'll tell you about shortly. Well, I mentioned the house has a history. There's George Washington. That's what he looked like when he lived there. Don't think of the old, old man with wooden teeth. This is a 45-year-old general uh, living in this uh, house. He took it over as, as, as his command headquarters. The councils of war were conducted in these rooms. Uh, the lower right-hand rooms on the first floor, that's where he had his office. He lived in the upper two floors. When Henry first moved in there as a tenant, those were the rooms he lived in. And the history of Washington, uh, the Adamses visited him there, Benjamin Franklin, Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American poet, came there. Uh, it, it has a really interesting uh, 18th century history as well as a 19th century history. And Longfellow knew this. He was cognizant of it the day he moved in. He moved in. He came, he, after the death of his first wife, he came back to Cambridge. He took up his duties at Harvard. He lived in a regular boarder's house. He was looking for a place to stay. Mrs. Craigie, the current owner then, uh, wouldn't let him in. She thought he was a student. She said, no, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't rent to students. He said, I'm a professor, I'm a writer. And he noticed his book there, Outra Mary. He said, you have my book right there. She said, you wrote that book, you can move in. <laughs> so she allowed him to have the second two rooms on the second floor. This is the one, and if you look up to a child, uh, Google it. It's a wonderful poem. But he he very often uses the poet the 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 house as as really as a fuel for his poetry. But in this particular one, he said, "Once thou, uh, once within these walls, one whom memory oft recalls, the father of his country dwelt." You'll find Washington in every room of the house. And that is very important. Well, Longfellow knew instantly the, the historical significance of this house when he moved in. And this is at a time when people aren't really saving and preserving houses. And when he marries Fanny six years later, the, as a wedding present, I'm jumping ahead, her father, who was one of the wealthiest men in America, Nathan Appleton, if you know Lowell, Massachusetts, the industrial textile city where I happen to have been born and brought up, 
Appleton was the founder of that. He, he created the first industrial city in America. That was, uh, so, and as a wedding present to his daughter and her husband, he gave them as a present that house. And I think it's kind of a 19th century form of prenup because really she's the only name on the deed. Uh, <laughs> It became his later, but uh, it was an extraordinary gift. But the house, as Longfellow's fame grew, it became this iconic uh, place. And I, I hesitate to use the word iconic, but it really became a destination, a, a destination not only for the Washington uh, connection, but as a place where people could come to see where the great poet lived. And Longfellow was wonderful. Anyone knocked at the door, if he was home, he would answer the door. And he said once, towards the end of, end of his life, a, a, a barely a day, or day goes not by that someone is the brass knocker at my door is not, is not pounding or some letter is beckoning me with its pallid uh, finger to that he has to, uh, that he has to. He answered all of his letters, 11,000 letters we know of that he responded to. And this is the house through its various, uh, the middle one is interesting, it's, uh, it was for uh, uh, an Independence Day celebration, it was on a stereoscopic view. All of these pictures, by the way, are mine. All of these pictures I took from, from uh, 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 materials that are in the Longfellow house. It was so popular it became a Sears Roebuck house. It was called the Magnolia. It was the most popular of its day. The, that is not the Longfellow house on the right. That's a, a Longfellow uh, Sears Roebuck replica in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it's now used by the Chamber of Commerce. And there are many of them all over the United States. Of course, that's a postcard in Minneapolis that looked nice. I put it in there. Uh, this is Henry. Henry had a nice little uh, hand with art. And that's how he saw the house. And that's his wife, Fanny, while she's still alive. And there are two of the little girls up there in the room looking out. And that's the governess in the middle, wi uh, middle, win middle window. So the house itself, wonderful. You talk about materiality of the house as a place, as a witness to so much of what is going on in this story. People who come and visit him. After the, after the death of Fanny, by the way, you're familiar with the book The Dante Club, Matthew Pearl's novel. Set. It's set in, in the Longfellow house. And all of his friends, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and uh, they, 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 they come, James Russell Lowell, they, they come and they spend time to prop up their friend Henry and they advise him. They listen to his translations of Dante and they meet on a regular basis. But really they're there to give him support uh, uh, during this horrible time while he's tra it's transitioning, while he's working on his translation of Dante. So part of what I'm trying to do is read the rooms. So what, what, what is remarkable, this house came over the National Park Service in 1972. It took a good 10 or 15, 20 years really to get the house museumized, curated, stuff sorted out, but everything has remained pretty much in situ. And this is the study, and this is these, uh, that's a photograph of Henry in his study. Uh, that's, a, that's a picture of his friend Charles Sumner, the senator uh, above him. Uh, there he is by the fireplace, he's sitting in his favorite chair. The bottom uh, uh, illustration was, uh, was in Harper's Weekly. <laughs> Uh, about 1878 or so. And here's uh, an image of the room today. Uh, when you talk about reading a room, it's remarkable. So the portrait is by his son, Ernest. Ernest uh, is a professional artist. Uh, you see in that, uh, by the way, look at, look at Henry. Look at, that, look at that window on the left. That's, there are 10, 12,000 books in the house. Books are everywhere. He converted several windows to bookcases. That's, that's one of them. But in this room, you'll see his friends. All of these portraits that you see on the right, there are six of them, are by Eastman Johnson. And this is the Mutual Admiration Society, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry's on the lower left, uh, Charles Sumner, uh, his friend Felton, who's a professor at Harvard, Dante, look at Dante. That's the lower picture uh, on the bottom and left, but that's also Dante on that pillar between the two windows. Dante presides over the room in the north corner. On the right is Shakespeare. You'll see Shakespeare in that image there. Dante is looking down at Virgil. Virgil is his guy. That's Virgil on the lower left. Uh, that's his writing desk. You'll see in the next image, he, has, he loved to write standing up. So that's his, his uh, writing desk standing up at one of those windows looking out over towards the Charles River. That's a statue of Goethe that it was always there as a sentinel of inspiration. That's Coleridge's writing. Uh, stand that's nearby, all of these implements. That's his chair. That's his writing chair. And that's the only picture done by Fanny. She was quite an accomplished artist. She was really his intellectual partner. And uh, she, I believe, had aspirations to be an artist. We'll discuss that. 
But there's her picture of Henry seated in his chair. That's the chair he was reclined in, by the way, when she had her horrific accident. We go into the library, which joins. Uh, you see the table at the uh, left image. That is the table, we believe, uh, if not that table, another you'll see in the next image where Fanny was seated with her children on a hot July day in 1861 uh, as the fashion of the day. They should have been someplace else. They should have been on the hut, escaping the hot weather. But there she was, and she was clipping uh, little snippets of her children's, of her daughter's hair, sealing them in envelopes with wax when all of a sudden, and nobody knows precisely what happened, but her dress caught on fire and she was enveloped in flames, and she ran uh, in a rush, screamed, of course, ran to the study. Henry was napping. He tr tried to put out the fire with a uh, throw rug. He was clean shaven up until then. He, he grew the beard afterwards. He was severely burned. His hands were burned, and she died the next day. They were 18 years. Uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes earlier, maybe several months earlier, uh, had, was, was writing by Craigie House. It was called Craigie House for one of the earlier owners. And he was, he was with a man named uh, George uh, 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 Curtis. And Curtis recalls Holmes averting his eyes from the house. And he said, why are you doing that? And he said, it is such a perfect house. Uh, any change that can happen in that house can only be for the worse. And his, his worst premonitions took place. So it, it's, you talk about you know, why he would turn to the translation of Dante, and, and we have that poem, Cross of Snow, so that you, that's kind of the bare bones. Now that Franz Liszt portrait that was uh, commissioned, he met Liszt, Liszt came to the door with a candle, uh, statues all over the place. Uh, you see uh, Aeschylus, uh, this is still the library. So if it wasn't that other desk, it was this desk. Uh, he's very, very supportive of women, uh, by the way. Sappho, Rachel Felix, you'll find uh, uh, Sarah Bernhardt came to the house, Jenny Lind came to the house. Fanny Kemble came to the house. They performed there. They had dinner in this uh, wonderful dining room. Uh, you really hadn't arrived in Boston, uh, uh, visiting Boston unless you had been invited to have dinner with the Longfellows. The two portraits on the wall that you see at the left are of uh, Fanny Appleton's parents by Gilbert Stewart. There are wonderful paintings, by the way, in the house. The picture you saw earlier of Fanny, you'll see that on the far wall. The other one of the two girls is on the left. So everything has its place. Normally there were eight people for dinner. They never had dinner parties larger than eight. If it was larger than that, they went into the library. Charles Dickens came here for breakfast when Henry was a boarder in 1842. Dickens will be a very important presence in my book because they, they become very good friends. And uh, Longfellow was his host during the 1842 visit, trip to the United States. He was doing the speaking tour. Uh, Longfellow invited him to breakfast. And they, were, they had breakfast on the second floor. 25 years later, they were both the, easily the most famous men in the world. I mean, in the Western world, Dickens in, the, in, in Europe, Longfellow in the United States. And, and Dickens makes a return trip to the United States. And on Thanksgiving Day, 1867, Dickens comes again to have dinner with the Longfellows. They have uh, Thanksgiving dinner in this room. Uh, eight people seated for, for dinner. They have a wonderful time. Dickens returns to his rooms at the Parker House that night, and he writes his son, and he said, we had a wonderful time, but for the whole evening, I couldn't get out of my mind the horrific uh, image of his beautiful wife in flames running, running, through, running to, the, to see him. It, was a, it must have been quite, a, quite a, an experience. So this is the same uh, Albert Bierstadt when Longfellow went to England, uh, he had got uh, uh, honorary degrees from uh, Oxford and Cambridge. He was at a dinner. He gave him this painting, The Departure of Hiawatha. Uh, and the back of that painting is the menu. You take down the painting, and there's the menu of that dinner. It's on the back. I can't tell you what's, uh, what, the, uh, what the menu was here, but it was a wonderful dinner. The painting uh, you see in the middle of the three girls, we'll get to that a little further on in the presentation. This was Mary Washington's parlor. It was also Fanny's parlor. Uh, we're moving around the house, reading the rooms. Uh, as we're going uh, through the staff, and I've probably made 50 trips. Every time I've done enough research, I say it's time to do a walking tour through the house. And we're going through one day, and there are statues everywhere. Now, it could be argued that Henry was a narcissist of some sort, because I said, who are the statues in here? And it was Henry, Henry, and Henry. Of the five, three were of Henry. 
uh, two of them uh, pre-beard, one post-beard, and there were maybe ten of them in the house. There were paintings of Henry, there were drawings of Henry, there were photographs of Henry. I love this. Now, this was hard to take. I, I, all these pictures I took, by the way, but uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Children's Hour, that wonderful poem, From my study I see in the lamplight Descending the broad hall stair Grave Alice and laughing Allegra, Allegra and Edith with golden hair. Those are the three girls you saw in the painting before. Now that little that little uh, uh, reproduction in the middle is no, it's two and a half inches by three and a quarter inches. It's a makeshift uh, frame. It was found in the battlefield of Gettysburg. We don't know whether it was Confederate or Union, but some soldier had carried that into battle. I mean, you talk about a poem and a, a poet who was really uh, the quintessence of domestic bliss, and uh, uh, it was Longfellow in the poetry, and, and, uh, and here's a material object that gives something, I think, to a particular, to a particular poem. Uh, it was one of it, and that was the painting, by the way, that was made of the three girls. Now, books are central to everything I do, and there are just about 12,000 of them in the house, and as you can see, they are shelved everywhere. 36 languages and dialects. He read 12 fluently. He translated eight, uh, not just Italian. He had two extended trips to Europe, totaling five years to learn languages. He was really quite brilliant. Uh, Harvard, when the when the uh, when the uh, National Park Service took custody of the house, uh, the trust also allowed the Houghton Library at Harvard <coughs> to come in and take their pick of things. And they got the literary manuscripts and the letters and the journals and things. And they took some of the books. Henry really didn't annotate his books, but he read them. And they're in multiple languages. And you'll find them all over the place. Uh, that was a non clamor said more, not sound, but love. Uh, that, was a, that was a little line that he'd found in uh, one of his earlier trips uh, from an unknown uh, Latin writer. And uh, uh, he liked it, and it became uh, his motto for many of his books. It's not in all the books, but it's in a lot of them. Uh, and many of them. And books are everywhere. Uh, that's another book uh, window case that's been, been transformed. Uh, they have uh, many thousands of them now in, uh, and uh, down in the basement. And now this is where the public doesn't go, by the way, down in the basement. So I've showed you the house as, as a structure, as a witness. I've showed you the rooms, which give living context to everything. Now we're getting into the artifacts themselves. Many, many thousands. Of them. I'm going to go very quickly through these because it's impossible. To, uh, to dwell on all of them, but Henry kept, and his family kept everything. They documented everything. I don't know what was on their minds, whether they were documenting their lives for posterity, but everything was retained. You're looking at drawer after drawer. People sent him things, people who loved his poetry. They sent him mementos, the pictures. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, com compressed shelving. It's not just for books. It's for every manner of artifact. Uh, we also have Fanny's letters, by the way, Francis... Appleton, Longfellow's letters, they have never been published. They haven't even been transcribed, and I work with these. Harvard didn't think enough of them to take them. Good for me. They're there. Uh, they're pretty hard to read, but uh, we're getting through them, and they are a gold mine of material. Uh, and really, you know, you look at some of some of them. She writes some beautiful Wattman paper. Others are a little sc uh, scratched out. There isn't a great correspondence with her husband because they were really never apart, but she has a wonderful correspondence with some friends, with Henry's younger brother, Sam, a good friend uh, named Emmeline Austin, uh, a number of people that she corresponds with, and she writes about everything, music, the issues of the day. She's really quite a brilliant woman. When they met, when she was just this 19-year-old girl in Switzerland, and Henry walked with her, and he was, she was trying to dazzle her with his knowledge of all these different languages. Together, they translated a poem from German. He later, he later conceded that her translation was better than his, and it was her translation that he used in a published book. She kept many journals, one they call her spiritual journal. This she began in 1833 when she was 16 years old. And this is the very, these are the very first lines of the journal. Let me write, write, write. Let me write out myself. Let me spread out my heart as a map whereon I may gaze. It's kind of nice. But she's very hard to get your arms around because you really wonder sometimes uh, exactly what it is she's she's uh, writing about, and uh, uh, especially when you get in the journal, that's the first one. She has a wonderful epigraph over there from the French, which my daughter Barbara translated for me on the f previous page. She has an excerpt from Shakespeare, a 16-year-old girl. But what makes this very difficult, I don't know if you can see it here, but she has scratched out some passages. She, she wanted to write, 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 but she also tore things out. If you see the uh, section on the right, there are about 
10 or 12 pages that have been shorn out in later years. And that upper little strip, all it says is my birthday is today, and then it picks up 10 pages later. What is she talking about? So we've gone back and we were trying to figure out, myself and one of the staff, so we've really worked on what she was writing on beforehand and what she was writing afterwards, and I think it's going to be very helpful. We'll get to it in the book. So there's that. This is fantastic. This is really a find as far as I'm concerned. Now, this is Fanny's sketchbook. The contents haven't even been photographed yet or scanned. I have taken the only pictures. They're scanning it for me as we speak. But it's a beautiful book. It's her sketchbook while she was tri making the grand tour with her family, the Appletons. Those are her initials, F-E-A. You see anything at the house, F-E-A or F-E-A-L, you stop. Feel as Francis Elizabeth Appleton Longfellow. For me, I pay attention. This is the sketchbook. So here are some of her sketches. Here's an 18, 19 year old girl. They're pretty fantastic. My pictures are okay. They're going to be better when we make the scans, but I just want you to see them. They're all dated. Here are some more. Here are some more. But this is the knockout. And my friend Jim Shea, by the way, the, the curator emeritus of the Longfellow House, he's been there 20 years. And he's, he has been uh, my Virgil. Dante had his Virgil. I have my Virgil. Jim Shea knows the 800,000 artifacts, and he's really committed himself to helping me find the things in the house that will help me. And he said, you should look at this book. Well, this was Fanny's wedding gift to her husband. The date in the lower right is the sketch, July 13th, uh, 1836. Their wedding day was July 13th, 1843. I don't think it's a coincidence. It was a Thursday in 1843. But what does it say? What's the inscription? Mary Ashburton to Paul Fleming. And I said, whoa. All right, does anybody know what that means? Wonderful. When Longfellow came back from, from Europe, he was dazzled, and he had been turned down. We don't know the circumstances. She rejected his proposals of marriage. He wrote a novel, the dumbest thing he ever did, a romance. He called it Hyperion. And <clears throat> he, he talks about, it's a thinly veiled Romana clay. Paul Fleming is the grieving uh, man. Mary Ashburton is this beautiful English woman who spurns his advances. And of course, everybody in Beacon Hill, when the book came out, knew who it was. She was furious, we know that, especially where he describes her as, as brilliant but not beautiful. And uh, so she wasn't very happy about that, but she was beautiful, and he had to make amends. How they, how they reunite is a story we can save for later. But when I saw this, and nobody has ever used this in any biographical treatment. Why? I think it's, I think it's so compelling. She has, tr she has spurned him for six years. Finally, she accepts his invitation to, for marriage. They're married very quickly. They pick this date. I think July 13th is obvious. It was the day they met, and she had that sketch. But she's saying, basically, the past passes the past, and the future is to come. It's Mary Ashburton. That's a material artifact that I think really you look for when you're do, doing something like this. But we also have 12,000 images in the house. Many of, them, many of them exist only in these daguerreotypes. They're encased. Uh, we can copy them. These are all my pictures. Uh, so we have them as the family. I won't identify all of them all, but I do want you to look at the upper left-hand picture. I'll, I'll give you a detail of it shortly, but that's the only place where we really see Fanny smiling in a photograph. You really had to, you know, when you're posing for photographs in the 19th century, all the muscles had to be tensed, and so you really don't smile. Uh, there she is with her two sons, and there are she, uh, the children up above. Uh, that's a photograph by uh, Julia Margaret Cameron that was taken in 1868 during that trip to England. Henry uh, Prebeard, Henry Postbeard. Uh, all of these pictures are in the collections. These are all copies I've made. He was quite the dandy, quite the clothes horse. He was really, uh, when she was first uh, introduced, uh, he sent up a card. She thought that the venerable professor, she didn't know who he was. She thought he was this really old guy. And then she said she thought he was the son of the professor. But he was not, not that bad looking, she thought. And uh, anyway, he was kind of dapper. And then, of course, afterwards, this is what he looked like, the leonine look, I like to call it. And this is family and, Fanny in various photographs. Uh, just remember the one you see in the upper right. We'll get to it in a bit. It's all studio photographs. Uh, but there's the smiling picture. Very brilliant, I think, incisive woman. And here, and by the way, all of the children's drawings are in the house, 600 of them or so. And these are pictures of the children. All, and they are all artistic. 
So this is Fanny through her children's eyes. Henry documented everything. There's the writing desk. So it's uh, Ernie's attempt at, at, at uh, Papa's standing desk, uh, given up in dismay. My eyesight, I can't read it very well. Uh, Edie's first musical uh, uh, composition up there. Dear Mr. Longfellow, will you come to tea, Edie Longfellow? He saved all this stuff. And this is 1861. This is right after he became a stay-at-home dad, and they brought in an English nanny. That's Annie's first needlework. That's all his handwriting. Well, this is all Henry's handwriting. <laughs> That's Ernie's first painting, and that is Ernie's first painting. And these are more of the children's pictures. Uh, Edie's portrait of the sister, more of these. This one kind of dazzled me because it was Edith to Papa, Christmas, 1862, and that's a year after uh, the, the, the death of Fanny. And there the children are around the Christmas tree, and I said, my goodness, who's that woman over there? But it was the governess. That was the governess who came in. Uh, it was not the mother. But, uh, uh, and by the way, they, they actually established a school in the house for the children and other children. Now, this, the, the, uh, the children also did little plays, and they did uh, all, uh, Charles Sumner and the various people who came, Louis Agassiz, they took part. The children wrote these little plays, The Secret. These are the, these are the ones that exist. Back to the trinkets again, uh, paintings by Ernie. That's a, that's a, a tiger's tooth. There are certain things that really did go to the basement long before the Longfellows left. Uh, those are paper mache ducks sent home by the older son, Charlie. Everything is documented. Uh, medals sent to Henry, that's the, some medal from France. Fans, many fans. He, he was a connoisseur of wine, many wine coasters. You say, well, what's the, what do these things tell you? They tell you a lot. Uh, the Hatchets, uh, an Indian tribe, uh, uh, very, uh, they loved his Hiawatha. They sent him uh, uh, original moccasins. Uh, this is a, a plaque that he, somebody gave him. This is Fanny's uh, jewelry box that she, that she uh, took to Europe with her before her marriage. All of these things. You see all of this jewelry made from human hair. This is something. Uh, another thing, human hair was quite an interesting thing that people, uh, that people did in the 19th century. And these are various uh, uh, items of jewelry that they kept. But what I want you to see here, this is Fanny's handwriting, and these are snippets of hair, the kinds of snippets of hair that she preserved from the children. And this is one of her daughters, 1847, and the, that one is still sealed, and uh, one of the children. This is, uh, so this is what she was doing when that horrific a accident happened. So much stuff in the house. Jim Shea was working. This is about 10 years or so ago. He's in a closet. There was a fan. He opened it up, and he saw these Chinese characters on it. The sun. And what it was, that's Henry's handwriting there. And this is, this is the, the sum of life in, Chi in Chinese, and by the, he names the artist. To tell you, just to give you some suggestion of how popular his po poetry was translated all over the world, here's a Chinese version of one of his uh, really very popular poems, The Psalm of Life, which, which was presented to him at a... At a uh, uh, dinner in the house by the American envoy to China. It was brought back, and there it was in a closet at the house. But again, this is what a museum curator does. You find this thing. Thankfully, uh, you know, you give context to objects. Objects are nothing unless they have, unless they have, uh, unless they have context. Well, there's a, uh, it's a, it's a statuette that a, 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 a sculptor sent him. It was, a, it was a, inspired by um, Excelsior, and he writes in his, his uh, journal about uh, receiving the present. This is a, from a dyke in, in, uh, in Canada from Evangelines. They sent that to him. Those are moccasins sent to him by some Indians. The lower left, those are fragments from the casket of Dante. Now, you might say, this is this, are these fragments from the true cross? No, those are fragments from the casket of Dante because they were moving Dante's uh, uh, casket at some point, and one of the one of the people responsible, some fragments fell off, and they packaged them up and sent them to Longfellow. It's got a pretty good provenance, and he kept them in the study right by the, by right by the uh, figurine of Dante. He kept all sorts of things. Now this is really weird. This one, can you read that? Pencil. Uh, this is the remains of the pencil with which Evangelum was finished. He kept the pencils, that he, and there are 25 years of them. All of those envelopes have pencils that Longfellow used and finished his poem, and he documented them. And that's all his handwriting with this, you know? It's, I, I mean, if there was DNA, I think somebody said he would, they would have kept their fingernail clippings. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. But for a writer looking for stuff, it's pretty great. He loved his cigars. That's an unopened uh, package of Havana cigars. 
that's a, uh, uh, lower left is a, uh, a mirror that he gave Fanny for an early, <laughs> for an early uh, wedding uh, anniversary present. The teeth, now that's disgusting, right? Two front teeth. How, why do I have that here, right? Uh, <laughs> it is funny. Right? But if you realize that his wife, Fanny, was the first woman in America to give birth to a child with the inducement of ether as, a, as an obstetric and aesthetic, and aesthetic, and aesthetic. It was 1846, the first woman. He invited, Wendell Holmes was a physician. They invited a fellow over from Harvard who was working with it. They tried it in England. It was controversial. A lot of people felt w women should really endure pain during childbirth. She decided she'd already had two children, and if there's some way to avoid it, she would. Uh, she delivered the child. It was wonderful. It was painless. He witnessed it. He was so impressed. He writes in his journal the next day, the day after the child is born, because this guy was also a dentist. He was actually the founder of the Harvard Dental School. He goes and he has two his, these two teeth extracted, and he said they administered the gas, and he started laughing uncontrollably. And he was trying to say stop, but he couldn't move his lips. And the next thing he knew, the teeth were out. And so here we have <laughs> this is the replacements. So it's an interesting little artifact. That, uh, that hand is the cast hand of Frederica Bremer, who was a very famous Swedish writer. And she traveled, and she wrote a number of best-selling works, and she loved Longfellow. He served wonderful wines. And she wrote beautifully about her visits with he and Emerson and all the great writers of the day. And while she was there, he took her into Boston and made a cast of her hand. And there's the cast. The kids' toys, all the children's toys, uh, gifts, New Year's gifts. Boys being boys. All right, that's a little toy, right? That's a blown-up gun. Uh, Charlie was a handful, the firstborn. And the mother, she, I mean, it comes close to abuse. She said Charlie's going to be, uh, he, she leaves him to her father because he is a really adventurous, tough little kid. And he likes to draw pictures of fighting ships and soldiers and of uh, people fighting with Indians. And he took out this toy gun one day and he put, uh, put gunpowder in it and he shot it and he blew off most of his left thumb. Uh, and they kept the... They kept the uh, they kept, they kept that's not funny, but there, there you have it. Uh, uh, the collections also in, include hundreds. How popular was Longfellow? All of this music inspired. Uh, and I have only gotten through the H's, by the way. I, would, uh, and for, I still have many hundreds more to go through, and this is just a selection of photographs of music uh, that was inspired by his works. Uh, and Longfellow wrote everything. That's the Longfellow jug by Wedgwood. But that's his handwriting down there below. He's identifying it. These are reviews of his poems. This is his handwriting. He he does many pre-Google things, I will tell you. He, he collects thousands of thousands of prints and illustrations. He writes about places he's never visited, and sometimes he gets it wrong. When he starts Evangeline, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. Well, there are no murmuring pines and hemlocks in the part of Canada he's writing about. But, you know, it's close enough. And uh, he doesn't really care about being that precisely accurate. But uh, here are more of the things. Uh, Old-fashioned, what does it say? Old-fashioned pictures. These are, these are various illustrations that he used for his writing. Now, we were, this, all the clothing. That's 150-odd years after Fanny died. Now, that's Jim Shea on the left, and that's two of the staff. It was kind of amusing. I said, "Boy, what would Fanny Long, what Appleton think if she knew we, here we were going through her underwear?" You know, 150 years later. But that, those are her monograms. Fa. You say, "Okay, it's clothes. What's the big deal?" You know, uh, but it's elegant clothes, handmade shoes in France. Yeah, those, that's one of her bonnets. Those are the children's shoes you see down there. That shoe and left, they they identify. They've written on it whose shoes they were. We had this one dress. Remember that one picture I showed you there. And I don't know if you can read the cut line there, but it's a purple white. I can't read it here. My eyes are terrible. But uh, it's that particular dress that they found in a drawer. They've identified it. And, and you say, okay, that's an interesting picture too. So what does that tell you about it? Not much except that it's elegant clothing. But here's a picture. Here's something that just blew me away. Again, it's, it's, it's right up there with the uh, sketchbook. So they had this dress. Again, it was in a box. And, of course... It's beautifully made. It's wonderful fabrics. And then there's also this picture in the collections, and there's little Alice Longfellow as Evangeline in 1856. That's the dress. This picture tells you a lot of things. Number one, she's a charming little girl. They've, they, it's a wonderfully expensive dress. Uh, his poetry is so popular, they're doing representations of it. And they went into Boston. They had a studio photograph taken, and they colorized it. And this picture is 
we just found that. That's recently discovered, the lower right one. And there she is with her two little sisters. Really had to work on that to get the image. I think that's a pretty interesting piece of uh, clothing. How about this? Lieutenant Charles A. Longfellow. Well, the mother died in 1861. Eighteen months later, Charlie left home, joined the Union Army to his father's mortification. He wrote a letter, if I die in the service of my country, so be it. Henry was grief-stricken, but there was nothing I could do. Charlie was wounded in battle. If you see the entry wound on the left, the exit wound on the right, just where the spur is, and you can see those two holes on the left. Charlie, I said, was quite a character. Multiple. Many. He traveled the world. He lived in Japan. He traveled through Asia. He was one of the first people to go through the Suez Canal. And uh, he wrote letters home. He bought up Japanese artifacts. His father would write him, you're spending too much money. But his father really couldn't stop him. Because, again, he was an Appleton. And after the death of his mother and the death of his grandfather, he inherited a vast fortune on his own. And he was traveling. But he was also sending Henry back information. I think he was traveling vicariously through him. Uh, and Charlie was kind of a favorite of his father. Here's Charlie again. Look at the picture in the lower right. He had a carp tattooed on his back in Japan in 1870-something. Can you imagine this? Boston Brahmin. This w really wasn't known until about 10 or 15 years or so ago when the pictures were discovered. It's not a very good picture, but there's a, there's a better picture of it. But there he is. That's Charlie. Moving along. So I wanted to go upstairs. Nobody is allowed to go upstairs. There's the front of the house because Henry also stored books upstairs, and uh, they're all empty now. Many of the books are downstairs, and I wanted to see the whole house. And also the servants, the domestic staff lived up there. And I also wanted to rummage around. Look at that. That's the trunk room, 30 trunks, and you have an H. Is that terrific or what? An HWL trunk. That's a bath for an adult over there on the right. That was a wheelchair for Charlie. He uh, died young. He lived a fast life, and he, he died young. He was uh, probably an opium user. He probably had some unspecified uh, things that he picked up in the Orient. We don't know. But he, he died at 48. <clears throat> and that isn't enough. I wanted to go up to the roof. David McCullough wanted to go to the roof when he was doing his book on the Adamses, and they wouldn't let him. And I've been begging to go up. And as you can see, the house is really made of brick. You can see the brick, but there's wood on the outside going up there and here we going and that's where we're going folks we're going up on the roof and there we are but we can't see the charles river i wanted to see the charles this is i call, my first chapter is called camelot on the charles and when this when washington took this house of course all this growth is, has built up i think when the leaves come down we'll be able to see it but it's right beyond that tree line you can see the charles and the british troops are banked over there his troops were over here. Washington would stand in that same place where I'm standing now. It gives me chills when I do something like that. Again, there was a lot of Appleton money. So that house next door, that's where the, the daughter Annie lived. And that's the Longfellow house through the window. Uh, the woman in the lower, that's Frankie. That's uh, Frankie Thorpe. That's Edith's granddaughter. And she actually, in a, in a re... In a re uh, they replayed the, uh, they did a, a, a recreation of the wedding of Fanny and Henry, and she wore the original dress. Well, of course, she's about 90 now. Lovely lady. And these two houses are privately owned, but we had a nice tour of that house. Beautiful homes. So also, I put in this little sequence, I'm giving a, a presentation in the hut in a couple of weeks. And so in the hut, he went in summers to the hut. These houses, these photographs weren't known until six weeks ago. They thought there were no pictures of the Nahant Cottage. There they are. That picture of Henry is on the porch. That's where they should have been that day that it happened. Nahant's a little tombolo off the coast of Boston. Tombolo is an island at high tide, and it's connected to the inland, uh, to the mainland at low tide. So there's now a causeway. But his house was at that third little inlet on the left. That's what it looks like now. It burned to the ground in 1896, and it's now privately owned. You talk about going from one extreme to the other. I'm going to go very quickly through these now. These are Ernie's pictures. Charlie sailed the Atlantic. It was a record-setting trip. These are Ernie's pictures of Nahant. Moving very quickly, because I know we're running out of time. There's also, he was born in Maine, so there's also a Maine connection. That's the Wadsworth Longfellow House in Portland. His father was a lawyer, former member of Congress. The house is just as interesting. That's the Appleton House in Beacon Hill in Boston. That's where Fanny was brought up. And when he died, at the centennial, never had a poet been so widely loved, never was the death of a poet so widely mourned. 
all over America, thankfully, you find, and, and also in Westminster Abbey, the only American to be honored in Westminster Abbey with a bust. There it is. There's a, a DuPont Circle in Washington, Nova Scotia, Evangeline, uh, Hiawatha, Paul Revere in Boston. And we end with, at his grave, we have a, we have a, a birthday party for him every year. It happens to be in February. And if you notice, Mary, he sent Mary to Cambridge. And Mary is buried there, and he wrote, that day, he said, yesterday I was at Mount Auburn and saw my own grave dug. That is my own tomb. I assure you, I looked quietly down into it without one feeling of dread. And he's there with Fanny and their baby who died at 18 months. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any, any questions?